Good afternoon. The next item of business today is portfolio questions, and we start with question number one from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, officer, to the Scottish Crofters Federation recent findings that many crofters believe their incomes have been significantly affected by wildlife. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. I recognise some wildlife species can have an economic impact on crofters. The Scottish Government works collaboratively with uh, SNH and a range of stakeholders to manage and reduce adverse impacts of wildlife on farming and crofting in Scotland. A range of strategies and control measures are in place to help support crofters, for example, the Sea Eagle Management Scheme. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. So can I ask what will the Scottish Government uh, take to ensure that a balance can be reached so that wildlife does not have a detrimental impact on crofting incomes? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think uh, a member raises a, a fair point. There does need to be uh, a balance. I just came from a meeting with uh, uh, a Malcolm and, uh, and Chris Cameron from the Monitor Farm in Loch Aber and Sea Eagles was mentioned as uh, causing uh, loss of, of his stock of lambs. And I'm aware this is a very serious issue indeed. And there are management schemes, the Sea Eagle management scheme in place. So I think a balance is the right measure. I'm, pro I'm glad that the member has approached the matter in that way. Uh, and I think we need to constantly ensure that the measures are sufficient to enable farmers to be able to manage and protect their stock against what is not just a source of financial loss, but also a great source of, uh, uh, of loss, personal loss, of misery for farmers who really care about their livestock deeply. Question number two, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has carried out on the potential impact of sheep farming in relation to Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. A no-deal Brexit is by far the biggest threat to farming and to our successful food and drink sector. A wealth of government and independent research concludes that the sheep sector will be worse off in every possible alternative trade arrangement. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As you will be aware, the UK government has promised and failed to publish its tariff rate quotas. Can can he therefore advise what the impact of this failure will be on our trade with the EU on key food products such as Scotch lamb? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is really disgraceful. It's quite extraordinary that we're so close to 29th of March and we still don't know what the tariffs will be. They were supposed to have been published for the last three weeks, as I understand it, but been delayed uh, by the UK government. This is a very serious point, presiding officer. The sector of farming, most at risk, and indeed, part, arguably, of the whole economy is sheep farming. And that's because if there's a no deal on the 29th of March, then the EU is a vital export market. And we don't even have the legal right to export at all at the moment. But even if that is secured, uh, then the tariffs would be uh, above 40%. If the pound depreciates, as experts in the economy believe, then the combination of the depreciation of the pound and the imposition of a tax of 40% would see a massive loss of market in Europe and a loss of income to primary producers. And the saddest thing of all is Michael Gove understands and agrees with all of this. Uh, and still, they will not remove the no deal from the table. So I, I, it's not too late. They can do so. And I would repeat the First Minister's calls, urging them to do so for the sake, not least, of our hill farmers in Scotland. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, the UK Government confirmed this week that because of Brexit or the uncertainty of Brexit, they are unlikely to introduce a change to sheep ageing for the purposes of TSE uh, control. Uh, that, uh, under the new system proposed, sheep producers would have received far greater certainty on the price they received for sheep from the abattoir. Would he take this matter up with his good friend, uh, Mr Michael Gove, and see if the UK Government could in instead go back to the previous arrangement they'd given an assurance they would achieve? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm glad Mr Scott's raised this. It's a very important matter. And we had been working with the UK government to remove the, the teething test. And the teething test, and I mean, I'm not a farmer myself, so I've had to learn about this, but every single lamb needs to have their mouth opened to check to see whether their adult teeth have come through as a proxy to sell how old they are. Now, if you've got 500 sheep all scattered all over mountains and hills, 
that's not just the easiest thing to do, presiding officer. So we've been working with the UK government, and my colleague Marie Goujon has been dealing with this, uh, and we've been confident that a scheme was going to be agreed to remove the need for this in a way that's perfectly practicable and consistent with animal welfare standards. However, without consulting us, just in the last few days, the UK government have said that they're not going ahead with this. Uh, I find that absolutely extraordinary, uh, and I do very much hope that the UK will reconsider their approach. Meantime, we are having discussions with the NSA uh, and uh, others, and I'd be keen to keep Mr. Scott and others advised about how those discussions proceed, because there may be difficulties in pursuing a Scotland Alone project here. It would be far preferable if there were a UK solution on this matter. Thank you. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. The presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what preparations it is making for business continuity for wholesale food providers in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, like all parts of the food and drink supply chain in Scotland, presiding officer, a, a no-deal Brexit is likely to have serious consequences for the wholesale sector. Uh, as it happens, uh, I met just this morning uh, with the Wholesale uh, Federation as the member may know, uh, and uh, had a very interesting discussion, and they told me specifically of disadvantages that uh, are already being experienced because of the possibility of a no deal. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for that reply. Uh, Bid Food is a large wholesale provider based in Newbridge in my constituency. These are anxious times for that company. Uh, can the Scottish Government reassure Bid Food that they will get information as soon as it becomes available in terms of contingency planning and ensure it will do what it can to ensure continuity in the supply chain to ensure it can continue trading in the way it does? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I'm happy to provide that assurance as I did to provide to BID's representative who was at the meeting earlier this, this morning, um, or this morning. Um, the wholesale sector did say that already storage costs, storage costs are rising. Already there is hardly any, if any, chilled storage capacity. There are already price impacts. There are already some instances of stockpiling by major players. So already there are presiding officer impacts. And I agreed that we will, of course, keep the wholesale sector, a very important sector of our economy, uh, in the members' constituency and others fully advised as far as we are able to. But we can only advise them of information once we have it. And sadly, there has been a, an information deficit from the UK government of late. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. The cabinet secretary will have seen reports that some uh, overseas customers have already started buying produce from elsewhere. Does he share my concern that the impact this could have on exporters and also livestock farmers in particular, who according to the HMRC could face EU tariffs of 70% on beef and 45% on lamb post Brexit? What is the Scottish Government doing to help our exporters of food and livestock find alternative markets in this scenario? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we're in regular contact with them, with their representatives. I have had weekly discussions. There is a SCORE meeting this afternoon. My colleague, Marie Goujon, will be at that. Uh, my officials are in regular contact with companies, and we provide export uh, assistance in a number of ways, including an element of financial support. Uh, but there's only so much we can do, and the problems are so serious that it may be impossible, frankly, presiding officer, to mitigate them. So uh, the consequences of a no deal, particularly for the red meat sector, would be uh, really extremely serious, extremely serious. And that's why a no deal really must be removed from the table. It can be removed, and therefore not to do so is not just a run-of-the-mill government mistake. I mean, you know, there's no government in the world that doesn't make mistakes. This is negligence. This is recklessness. This is culpability. And it needs to be sorted now. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Any delay in fresh food would have a disastrous effect with whole consignments being lost. What contingencies have been put in place to protect wholesalers and producers who stand to lose those, those consignments? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Rhoda Grant is, is quite right, and from the Highlands and Islands, and we represent Highlands and Islands constituencies and region, um, the, 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 the export, for example, of shellfish uh, is subject to very tight timelines. The supply to markets in Italy and Spain, for example, 
have timelines which, if delay longer than a few hours, the whole consignment becomes valueless. And therefore, uh, we have done a power of work, both in respect of, uh, of trying to ensure that drivers have permits to drive in Europe, and the, uh, there is a real problem with that, both in respect of the additional export certification, which the aquaculture sector say would rise from 50 to 200,000, mm -hmm. an additional cost of 15 million, uh, uh, quite ridiculous. We're working with local authorities in order to have a contingency plan in order to deal with the issue of export health certificates, which are dealt with by EHOs, in order that that contingency plan can cope uh, with a fourfold increase in the workload. Uh, and we are doing various other measures to ensure that information is passed out to all processors so far as we have it. But again, presiding officer, there's only so much we can do to mitigate uh, and to anticipate without the hard information that we need from the UK government in relation to the impact of whatever it is they finally decide to get around and what to do. Uh, it's impossible to fully prevent the enormous damage that will be caused, not least to our inshore fishermen and all of those who rely upon them. Question number four, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of the red meat industry and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I regularly meet with representatives. Uh, last week I met with the National Sheep Association and Scott Beef. Uh, the week beginning the 18th February, there was the debate between myself and Michael Gove. The NFUS, the meat wholesalers, the NSA and QMS all attended. On the 19th of February, we had a food resilience group meeting that I chaired, where I was in discussion with the industry. And prior to that, I spoke at the NFUS AGM. And last Saturday night, I had the pleasure of dinner at the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association. And at lunchtime, I met several farmers from Loch Aber in the meat sector. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that detailed answer. Some producers have adopted alternative treatments to process meats instead of using nitrites. In light of the 2015 World Health Organisation report, which concluded that nitrites can cause cancer. However, nitrites continue to be widely used and a recent investigation by the Herald on Sunday found that in Scotland, three quarters of our councils contain nitrite meats on school menus. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what the Scottish Government is doing to help industry remove nitrites from processed meats? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I understand that my colleagues, Mr Swinney and, and perhaps Mr Fitzpatrick, are primarily dealing with this, so it's not my portfolio area. But I'm advised that, presenting officer, that nitrites play an important role in food safety in helping to reduce the growth of harmful microorganisms. But there are strict maximum permitted limits that can be used by manufacturers in ham, bacon or gammon product recipes. Um, the European Food Safety Authority reviewed nitrites as food additives in April 17 and concluded there was no need to change statutory safe levels. Scottish red meat is a completely appropriate food to serve in school and does not have added nitrites. Uh, so I, I do know that these matters are under consideration uh, by Mr Swinney following a, an extensive consultation which took place uh, last August and that we're analysing carefully the responses uh, on these matters. And I'm sure that uh, Ms Lennon will be in contact with Mr Swinney to get the up-to-date detail on that. Question number five, Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Rural Secretary has had with the Transport Secretary regarding the impact on the rural economy of the proposals in the Restricted Rose 20 mile an hour speed limit bill. Uh, to date, I haven't had any formal discussions with the Transport Secretary regarding the impact of the uh, bill. However, the member will be aware from the evidence that my colleague Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary responsible, gave to the Rural Economy Committee yesterday that Transport Scotland officials are working with COSLA and the Society of Chief Officers of Transport in Scotland to better understand the current barriers to implementation, including the traffic regulation order process, in order to assist and encourage more local authorities to introduce 20 mile an hour limits and ensure greater consistency across local authorities. Mike Rumbles. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Indeed, yesterday, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee heard in evidence that the costs of this bill would impact disproportionately across rural Scotland and could lead to the expenditure of tens of millions of pounds of public money. So will the Cabinet Secretary, in the interests of joined up government, express these concerns about the financial impact 
and the dis disproportional impact on the rural economy to his cabinet colleagues. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to relay the, the comments that uh, Mr. Rumbles has made. I will uh, study the official report myself of the evidence given yesterday so that I fully understand it. I haven't an opportunity so to do as yet. Uh, and uh, I, I'm sure that Mr. Masson will want to give these matters very careful consideration indeed. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you. Um, in that discussion between the two Cabinet Secretaries, will the Rural Cabinet Secretary also acknowledge that the financial modelling behind this bill was indeed developed with the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation Scotland, fully acknowledging the differing characteristics of rural roads, and that in fact uh, we see dozens of rural community councils supporting this bill and significant numbers of councils, Highland Council, Shetland Council, Orkney Council, Angus Council, Dumfries and Galloway Council, Stirling Council, many other urban councils as well, back this bill because they believe it will be a cheaper and more effective way to save lives. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I, I have myself studied the modelling to which the member refers, but I'm sure that, that uh, very serious consideration will be given to these matters by Mr. Matheson, and indeed I... Uh, I heard, heard and listened carefully to what the First Minister said in response to uh, a, the member's colleague, Alison Johnson, at First Minister's question time today. So it's quite appropriate that very careful consideration is given to uh, all of these matters for which, as the member knows, I'm not directly responsible. Jamie Green to be followed by... Thank you for setting off, sir. The Cabinet Secretary may have heard evidence yesterday from Police Scotland that uh, enforcing these 20 mile per hour zones was not necessarily a priority for them and in rural areas it is actually country roads where drivers are travelling at high speeds where the majority of accidents are. Does he agree with me therefore that uh, any shift in focus from these accident hotspots uh, would actually uh, affect the overall efficacy of the intended policy of the bill? Camera second. Um, well I need to think about that one if you don't mind so I'm not going to give you a direct answer but what I would say is this that I've always thought that it is very very sensible to listen carefully to what the police road traffic experts have to say about road safety. Uh, they have to deal with matters that none of us would wish, uh, particularly the horrific consequences of, uh, of road traffic incidents where there's loss of life. And there's a whole raft of, of things that we need to do as, as individuals, as citizens, and as uh, representatives of people of Scotland to ensure that road safety uh, is given the priority that it rightly deserves. And Julian Martin. President officer, with regard to road haulage, can the Cabinet Secretary advise how many ECMT permits road hauliers in Scotland have applied for and how many they've received back and what impact this might have on post-Brexit export and import of key foodstuffs, including on wholesale providers and on seafood and fish exporters like the one, ones in North East Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are worried about this matter. The, the answer is we understand that Businesses in Scotland have applied for 680 permits. That's 800, 680 permits of uh, individual lorries to be used, which are used for export purposes, as I understand it in most cases at the current time. Of the 680 applications, only 48 have been received, so that uh, 632 were unsuccessful. Uh, this is just a stark illustration of the lunacy of not ruling out a no deal. Uh, because without these permits, the, these drivers will not be able to drive to Europe with our shellfish, with our lamb, with our exports. This is a ludicrous and preposterous situation. I'm very grateful that the member has given me the opportunity to highlight it. And I'm pleased the minister knew the answer to that question. <laughs> question number six, Jamie Green. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in meeting its tree planting targets and creating 10,000 hectares of new trees in 2019. Cabinet Secretary. Good progress. Jamie Green. <laughs> Good but undefined, Cabinet Secretary. Um, perhaps I could drill a little bit further. Uh, this Parliament agreed to allow the sale of land uh, of uh, National Forestry State, provided that the revenues received from that would be properly reinvested. So perhaps the Cabinet Secretary would be more specific in my supplementary question. Of the 50,000 hectares of land that have been sold, how much land has been acquired in numerical terms? And secondly, of the over £100 million 
of revenue achieved through the sale of such land, how much has been spent on both acquiring land and planting trees? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I mean, I gave a direct answer to the question that was asked. We're making good progress. He now raises a, an entirely different question. I am able to say that I have already provided the, as I understand it, presiding officer, I've already provided this information to the committee of which Mr. Green's a member. Uh, I don't know whether the convener has passed on the letter, but it's there anyway. And what I can say is that the, the, uh, I'm proud. I mean, I'm, this, this sort of implicit attack on Forestry Commission, Forest Enterprise, or apparent attack seems to me to be completely groundless. Obviously, they are reputable, responsible bodies which are going to be fully devolved very shortly. They do a great job. Uh, they, they sell and purchase land for a whole variety of purposes. But what they do is invest the money for the purposes for which they are established, promoting forestry in Scotland. If the member is suggesting money is siphoned off for other, for other uh, purposes irrelevant, then I'm afraid I don't really think that there's uh, evidence to back him up. But I would refer him to the letter which has already answered this matter in great detail. And Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how land coverage by forestry compares in each of the countries in the UK and how much of the UK's new planting is done in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, a, from memory, the, the forested cover accounts for 18 to 19 per cent in Scotland. It's significantly less down south. So forestry is much more important in this country than it is proportionately for the rest uh, of uh, the country and I'm very pleased that we are making good progress in the forestry uh, sector and that's playing a, a big part in helping to provide employment in rural communities. I was very pleased to meet a series of young apprentices that are being taken on uh, by the public sector and forestry at Baloch in my constituency just a couple of weeks ago uh, and I think the industry will be taking on many more young people, uh, which is a, is a good thing and it's a sign of its success. Thank you very much. And that concludes portfolio questions. We're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 16170 in the name of Kate Forbes on Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2019. Could I invite all members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible.